Hi there, and thanks for watching. Um, you've stumbled on what could probably best be described as a Harrier home movie. Uh, this film was shot many years ago by me on a newly acquired 8mm video camera uh, back in 1988, um, which back then was state of the art. Uh, unfortunately, there was no digital high definition or stabilisation modes back in those days, so I apologise for the quality. So what you're about to see is uh, 20 minutes of footage that I filmed on a Harrier field site in Germany uh, at a place called Kalkastrasse in the Senelager training range which is just north of Paderborn. I uh, took the camera out and uh, decided to take it in the back seat of a two-seat T4 Harrier on a short sortie which I filmed um, to, together with some of the other footage of the aircraft uh, taking off and landing. We begin the film yeah. in the operations wagon as we make our final preparations for the sortie. You can see here the site commander just catching up on some local news. And those of you familiar with aircrew interview will probably recognise uh, that gentleman from a previous in, uh, Harrier interview. Uh, in the uh, shot here we've got Chris on the right who's my pilot and we're just going through what we call the outbrief, which is the final check before we walk out to the aircraft. Chris just realising that he's being filmed. Terry is the authorising officer there and he's going through a final checklist. Uh, we're just making sure that uh, we have planned everything safely and that uh, we have uh, got the latest updates on the weather. And of course, that everything is legal. Now, this is taking place in the back of a box body uh, on a wagon that's been driven out from Gutterslake. Uh, there are four of these wagons set in a cruciform, um, and they are essentially the, the, head, the headquarters of the site, the nerve centre of the site. So, we've got operations, uh, engineering here in another wagon, and we've got intelligence, and we've got flight planning wagon as well. Pretty cramped conditions, but um, everything you need to do really just to mount a Harrier sortie. Chris now goes through to see the ground liaison officer, uh, the GLOW, who is an army officer, and his job is to give us a final update on any uh, intelligence that we have on enemy forces and he's also issuing any secret codes to be used for the day. This aircraft's a GR3, you can see it's pretty well camouflaged, it's been prepared for flight. The aircraft are all up against the tree line and there are probably five to seven aircraft I guess on each side, enough to mount a full ship. And the pilots as they're preparing for the sortie they are communicating via a telebrief system which is it's basically like a landline uh, between the aircraft and between the operations uh, wagon and that way there are no radio transmissions uh, from the site. You can see Steve here in the cockpit getting ready for the sortie. Now I'm here strapped into the back seat of the T4 and you can see my view we're looking forward through the head-up display and the top of the ejection seat as Chris straps in. Now the T4 is designed as a trainer, designed to teach pilots how to fly the Harrier and so it is fully dual control. The view from the back is not bad, uh, not quite as good as the Hawk but still uh, not a bad view with the back seat um, sitting a little bit higher than the front. And you can see it's old technology and it's kind of uh, like a hunter cockpit with a head-up display. It's nothing fancy. One of the biggest problems we had on the field site was dealing with FOD, or foreign object damage. This is the, the, the problem of having stones and dirt being kicked up 
and sucked into the air intake, which can completely wreck a Pegasus engine. So we had to be very careful that the order in which the aircraft taxied out was such that they didn't point their jet pipes back at the aircraft behind. But even so, you can see here the amount of dust that's being uh, generated just by that one aircraft as it taxis towards the strip. The engine's starting now, you start to get a sense of the volume in the back seat. There's a very loud cockpit. And uh, as the electrics come online, you'll see the head-up display comes back to life. As we taxi out, it's a very short distance to the takeoff strip, and we've got uh, four checks to do, four essential checks, pre takeoff checks to do, known as the fast checks uh, F for flaps, A for armament master switch, which ensures that we can jettison any stores if we need to, uh, S for stove stop to make sure that the uh, nozzle stop is in the right place for the takeoff, and T for trim. And once we're on the strip, Chris does an acceleration check on the engine just to make sure that it's operating correctly and that fuel is flowing through the fuel control system uh, so that we're going to get full power. Uh, this is not a runway. It's been created by the Royal Engineers from PSA1 aluminium matting and it's only about uh, 400 metres long. Now the engine accelerates from uh, idle to full power in about four seconds and it's a tremendous acceleration you're forced back into the seat as the thing launches off down the strip and then at a predetermined speed the pilot smartly lowers the nozzle lever to 50 degrees to vector the thrust downward and lift the aircraft off the strip you can see the amount of dust and debris that's thrown up behind it and once clear of the trees the pilot slowly uh, rotates the nozzles aft accelerates and then uh, retracts the gear and flaps. As we fly along here, we're looking forward through the head-up display, which is in a navigation mode. In the centre, we've got the aircraft symbol that's rolling around horizon bars. At the top left is the airspeed, at the top right is the altitude, and at the bottom of the HUD is the um, compass heading. You can see the visibility is not great. This is a typical uh, summer's day on the North German plane. It makes uh, flying information quite uh, challenging. And we're flying here in formation with our leader who's in the GR3 and we're in what we would call a defensive battle position so we're flying line abreast on his left hand side about 3,000 metres which allows us to uh, fly our own line around terrain but also keep a good look out behind his aircraft and we're looking for missile launches either from another aircraft or from the ground. And the other thing you can see looking forward is the squiggly line on the canopy, which is the miniature detonating cord, or MDC. And this is part of the ejection system. So that in the event of an ejection, instead of jettisoning the canopy, uh, the canopy is actually fractured by that uh, detonating cord as the seat rises up. And it makes for a much faster ejection. As we approach the target, Chris has now positioned his aircraft behind the leader. He's navigating down the attack run and now he changes the head-up display to the weapons mode and you can see the vertical bomb fall line. He runs that through the simulated target of the day and when the release queue comes, he releases the weapon. 
and uh, there it goes and today obviously that's just a simulation and actually dropping anything. These field deployments uh, would take place a couple of times each year. Now this is back in 1988 of course when the perceived threat was from the Warsaw Pact to the east and uh, the scenario really that we were practicing was uh, what if Warsaw Pact forces reached the eastern border and started moving west. And our job was to go and slow down or stop the movement of uh, armour as it came west. So to that end, we were trying to mount as many sorties as possible in a day. And they were only short sorties. You know, they would typically be from 15 minutes to 30 minutes long. And it was not unusual to fly four sorties a day. You know, the maximum I flew was six. For the tactical part of the sortie, we're flying down to a minimum altitude of 250 feet and the cruising speed is 420 knots, which equates to about 8 statute miles a minute. Now for the attack portion, uh, we push the speed up to 450 knots, which is the equivalent of 760 feet per second. So we're moving over the ground pretty quickly. And uh, we use a half mil scale map for the tactical navigation and for the target area we used a 1 to 50,000 scale map which is a movement survey type of map. Now the aircraft's got an inertial navigation system but it's pretty basic, it uses old style gyros, there are no ring laser gyros and there was no GPS in those days. So Chris is really using the INS to get him into the ballpark but using the maps really to find the target. Uh, and you can see the reflection of the map on the side of the canopy there as he um, navigates. Now we're recovering to the site. Chris has pulled up and he's slowing down. Uh, he's going from a thousand feet as he descends towards the pad to be in a stable hover over the pad at about 150 feet. You can see the big white strip in the middle there is the chalk marking out where the takeoff strip was. And the trees in front of that are where the site is. So you can see it's pretty well camouflaged. Very difficult to see. So the airplane's configured. He's descending in towards the pad to stabilize at about 150 feet. And once you're over the pad, you can't actually see it. It's underneath the aircraft. So we actually use uh, day glow markers at 90 degrees to the pad so we can look and line those up. You can see the takeoff strip there as he settles into the hover. And he's coming down now to stabilise at about 50 feet just to check his position. We've got uh, medics there and a fire truck. Um, on, on hand and uh, you can also just see one of the day glow markers there. See Chris's head moving around as he lines up on the markers and starts to come down onto the pad. The T4 of course has got the extra cockpit uh, which makes it heavier than the GR3 so hover performance wasn't that great. The um, limit really on the Pegasus engine is, is temperature and it's the temperature at the back of the engine near the turbine that's critical. And so all of the Harriers, both the uh, GR3s and the later Harrier 2, have got water injection, which is a 50 gallon tank of demineralized water above the engine. And that uh, provides 90 seconds of water injection onto the turbine. Uh, that cools the turbine, allowing you to put more fuel into the combustion chamber and so increasing the thrust of the engine. Now as soon as the aircraft lands, uh, the throttles to idle, the nozzles go off, the flaps come up, the armament master switch goes back to safe and the lights come off and the water switch is switched off. The landing pad is also made out of PSA1 uh, aluminium matting and uh, there's a little bit of it uh, on the ground there over some soft earth and then the aircraft is taxiing back on, on grass. You can see this aircraft is carrying drop tanks which is a fairly standard fit although on these short sorties they would have been, um, they would have been empty.
The aircraft's now pushed back into the hide to be serviced and refueled ready for the next sortie. Now you can see on the nose there the squadron symbol which is the cockatrice denoting that this is a three squadron aircraft. Now during these Gutterslow field deployments uh, both three squadron and four squadron would deploy and each squadron would have two field sites making a total of four. You can see one of the engineers there has just removed a large grey bung from the intake and uh, that, that's put in there just to stop any foreign object damage whilst the aircraft's being serviced. Now Chris is now negotiating what is possibly the most hazardous part of the entire sortie which is getting out of the aircraft down those steps which are on an uneven ground. Always a bit of a challenge. Here's one of the GR3s in the hover. Now the aircraft can only hover at lighter weights. It was only ever designed uh, to do short takeoffs at the beginning of the sortie when it's full of fuel and carrying weapons. And then once the weapons have been expended and the fuel has been reduced, then the airplane is light enough to come back and hover. Now you can see it's a continuous descent down onto the pad. Quite a firm landing. Uh, one of the techniques that uh, you don't want to do in a Harrier is to stop and try to hover just a few feet above the pad or even to slow down the descent rate because what happens is you start to re-ingest the hot exhaust gas from the engine back through the intake and uh, you start to run out of power uh, which is a real problem especially during the summer and uh, you can see that airplane's got a FEMAT chaff dispenser pod on the centre line which uh, is quite unusual we didn't used to fly with that very often So we finished this film with a sequence uh, that I filmed uh, standing about 500 metres off the end of the takeoff strip as this GR3 taxis out. Now we flew this aeroplane for another 12 months and then we started to transition to the new Harrier 2, the Harrier GR5, which began to uh, arrive in uh, 1989. And we did a number of field deployments with the GR5, but then in August 1990, Gulf War One happened, and a year after that, in November 1991, the Berlin Wall came, came down, and those two events changed uh, things dramatically. Uh, the threat was no longer the Warsaw Pact from the east, and we no longer did field deployments with a Harrier and we changed the whole mode of operation of the aircraft. So thanks for watching this film and uh, I will just leave you with this final sequence of the mighty GR3 getting airborne from a field strip. <laughs>